thank you for being here. Um, well, um, it's difficult for me to speak in, a, in an open space. I, I'm sort of claustrophiliac uh, person, and um, but well, it's a good op opportunity uh, to to change something in my style of communication. And um, well, I, I will sp I will speak about nothing. Uh, to be more precise, I will speak about nothingness, nihil, annihilation. Um, and uh, so, uh, the, you know, in his uh, Trattato di Semiologia Generale, Umberto Eco says that we don't need language to, to say the truth. To, to show things. We just need a finger to do that. We need language in order to lie, in order to invent something that does not exist. <coughs> and recently, in his last book titled La Negazione, <coughs> Paolo Virno says that um, nature does not know, no, does not know the negation. We need language to do that. Well, I start from this, uh, from this point, but I want to go, <coughs> I don't really know where, but I want to go deeper in the direction of, uh, uh, of production, of the production of nothing in this case. And um, I start from a, a simple uh, consideration. Nothingness does not exist in nature. Uh, if, you, if you want to think about nothingness, uh, you have to start from uh, an act of uh, conscious existence, of linguistic existence. Let's think about that. Uh, Deleuze and Guattari never used the expression becoming nil, becoming nothing. Uh, if I remember well, maybe I'm wrong, but in my memory, I don't remember any point of their texts uh, where they say, becoming nothingness. They speak of becoming other. Becoming other. Becoming other is such a, a, a comprehensive concept uh, that you can say it's uh, comprehending, uh, it's uh, implying also that. And actually, when we think of that, we think about becoming other. The body is dissolving, uh, but matter is not becoming nothing. It's becoming other. And um, so if we want to, to approach the mm, idea of becoming nihil, of annihilation, we have to ask ourselves, who dies? Who dies when someone dies? Who is dying? The flesh, the body, is not dying. Is yes, it's dying, of course. Uh, it's not uh, being annihilated. It's not becoming nihil. It's becoming something different, many different things. But when you ask uh, who dies, uh, you are not talking uh, about the body. 
and you are not talking about the spiritual soul. I mean, I don't, I, I'm not thinking about a sort of spiritual soul. I'm talking an act, uh, about an act of language, the act of language which is uh, definable as self, as the possibility of saying uh, me, of saying uh, my my perception of the world, my word, my umwelt, in the precise sense of the word uh, as it is for me. This is disappearing. My environment, my world, the world uh, as it is the production of uh, my act of language, as it is the production of my desire, as it is the production of my fear. And so, by the point of view of nature, uh, that is becoming other. This is uh, absolutely clear in, 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 uh, in uh, uh, Deleuze and Guattari. When they speak of becoming other, they are, in a, in a very Spinozian way, they are saying, Becoming other is the process uh, of uh, dissolution, decomposition, recomposition, transformation. What is becoming uh, nihil? Uh, that the, this question equals the question who dies when someone dies. The inner touch, mm, that is the a possible definition of the self. Inner touch, the perception of uh, the self, uh, by the self itself, uh, is uh, the condition of any kind of perception, of any kind of projection, is the condition of the creation of the world. The world uh, intended as my world as the word of a self. What, what's the problem here? Why am I um, trying to find a, a sense uh, uh, to the, uh, of, of this word, of this concept, nihil, nothing? Well, it's my business, uh, but also in a sense, it's, uh, um, I'm trying to overcome the perception of a failure, of course. Um, I'm trying to come to terms uh, with, uh, uh, with my personal, um, with my personal story. Um, I am also trying to, to open a, a reflection on, on the problem of death, of of uh, growing old and uh, and dying. Hmm? Uh, actually, that has been, uh, by many points of view, has been denied, expelled from the field of uh, uh, of the Western um, thought and the Western culture and so on. This is no, this is known. This is not new, but. You know, the problem is uh, more and more evident in our time for many reasons. One, the most obvious reason is that growing old uh, once uh, and approaching death, uh, once upon a time uh, was a rare, exclusive, um, almost uh, um, dignified by, r by rarity condition. Uh, being old uh, used to be noble and important in itself. Nowadays, uh, we have an army of uh, uh, people who, who, who are unable to, to, uh, to care about themselves uh, and uh, who are becoming more and more uh, a, a problem. A, a, yes, a social problem, 
the social problem of growing old, of those people who have to be taken care by by uh, the uh, <laughs> the social welfare. And social welfare, you know, is becoming more and more teen. So I start thinking that in my future, if uh, if uh, if I am o if I if I have to grow old, uh, I I I will not have a, a welfare state thinking about me. I have to think about myself, uh, and uh, I'm I'm trying to think this problem first of all by m my personal point of view. But it's um, it's not a social problem. Nihil, it's uh, something uh, more than so. At the same time, starting from the ontological dimension of uh, becoming nihil, I think that we can uh, start imagining in a different way the social problem of uh, of um, well of the inability to to face uh, nothingness uh, well language and money new chapter language and money have something in common of course they are nothing and they move everything so i uh, i started speaking of language because it's so evident that language is nothing and is moving everything, particularly language uh, as the ability to move from being something to being nothing, because only in language something like that can, can happen. Only language is able to give a special meaning to the word being, better existing, and only language is able to shift from being something to being nothing. Also money has a similar ability. And um, I, I start understanding uh, that the incredibly uh, um, uh, the incredible transformation we are living nowadays, the transformation from uh, industrial capitalism to financial capitalism, just to say things in a very simple way, this transformation has very much to do with uh, the shift from uh, a, 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 an economic world in which uh, a, a money was coming out from production to a world, to a new economic uh, um, situation in which money is coming out from becoming nothing. Actually, think about the difference, uh, the, the transformation that we have, uh, that we are witness, uh, witnessing these days, particularly in Europe. Europe is a, a wonderful, uh, the European Union, uh, is a wonderful example of uh, this kind uh, of transformation. We have been uh, producing uh, something for 500 years, okay? Producing something, producing a lot of things. And uh, capitalism was essential based on the ability of uh, 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 accumulating value one can use the expression plus value from the uh, production of something. You have money, you produce uh, tables, you sell tables, then you have uh, more money. All of a sudden, the process uh, changes up to a point that we, we, 
we have some problems in understanding what actually happens. All of a sudden, Europeans have been told that you are poor. Why so? What's happened? All of a sudden, in the space of one or two years, uh, we have been declared poor. Not you, the Austrians, maybe. Wait a minute. Certainly, the Greeks, the Italians, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Irish, uh, little by little the French, uh, and who knows what happens tomorrow, we have been declared poor. Why so? What has happened? Actually, engineers and doctors and uh, technicians and uh, workers have been producing uh, a world of richness, of prosperity, things, material things, uh, semiotic things. All of a sudden, things disappear. And uh, we discover that uh, the accumulation of value is not coming out anymore from the production of plus value, but is coming more from the production of minus value, a sort uh, of uh, magic effect of uh, accumulation comes out from the destruction of things, from the destruction of useful things, up to the point that you can become rich betting on the failure of an enterprise. So you destroy that enterprise. It's, it's the most, uh, uh, it's the most uh, enriching uh, kind of, of activity, the activity of magically dissolving something that has been produced in the past. This is the, 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 the secret, in a sense, of a process of accumulation of value coming from the destruction of uh, things. In a sense, uh, during the last five years, uh, at least in Italy, you know, in Italy, the industrial production has decreased of 25% in the last uh, five years. 25% of the industrial uh, uh, world has disappeared. It's no more there. It's a magical act. And uh, then uh, 8 billion uh, euros have been withdrawn from the educational system. Now it's the turn of the health system in Italy and so on and so on. Why so? What's happening? Why? How can it happen? Because this is the only way to produce value in the field of financial capitalism. Financial capitalism is too weak as an expression. The word capitalism is becoming something too vague, we should be able to invent something new at the level of language. We want to be able to invent something also at the level of protecting our future, imagining uh, a future, and so on. Prophecy. I changed my my subject uh, once more because I want to go back to language and I want to speak about uh, prophecy and poetry. Prophecy, as you probably know, is um, used to be or is uh, an activity which is essentially based uh, on the ability of uh, imagining uh, the imminent, starting from uh, the um, uh, interpretation of uh, visions. The prophet, according to Maimonid, for instance, uh, is someone who is able to interpret uh, visions in such a way that from the association of uh, 
unrelated things, the prophet is able to foretell, to imagine, if you want, what is going to happen, what is happening next. Prophecy. What is the imminent? Imminent uh, is something that is described in the present. Actually, uh, imminent uh, is imminent. Uh, imminent uh, is not something that comes from outside and takes uh, the place of your attention. Imminent is something that is already here. Call it the tendency. Call it the implied uh, imminence. Uh, call it as you like. Uh, imminent uh, is uh, already here. And the prophet uh, is doing something uh, simple by this point of view. He is simply saying, I can tell you what is happening, what is coming to happen tomorrow because I can read the signs, the symptoms, the, the, the presence of something. The poet has something to do with the prophet, because also the poet, as you know, is able to find the relation between uh, unrelated things uh, and is also able to imagine something that is coming in the future uh, just because he is, uh, is, uh, is uh, associating unrelated, uh, unrelated things and unrelated visions. But the poet, uh, well, the poet, poetry, let's say, as a function. Um, Poetry is, uh, is doing something more than, than, than prophecy. Uh, poetry is prophecy in a sense, can be prophecy in a sense, but is also able to put a body in, in, in between, between the present and the imminent. Poetry is the ability to transform the imminent imminence uh, into something unpredictable. Poetry, by this point of view, is the ability to shift something in the relation between uh, the, 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 the present, the imminent, uh, and the possible. Chapter 4. Nihilism. I go back to my, my nihil, to my nothingness, uh, and I try to, to understand something of the concept of nihilism. As you know, of course, uh, nihilism can be um, understood by two different points of view in uh, Morgan wrote, uh, Nietzsche says that, um, well, he speaks uh, of, uh, of the non-existence of, uh, of a moral law and, uh, more deeply, of the non-existence any, of any kind of natural law. Actually, he says there is no eternal justice which requires that every fault shall be atoned and paid for, and so on and so on. And he says, uh, um, it is not the things themselves, but the opinions about things that do not exist, which have been such a source of trouble to mankind. It's not the thing, it's the opinion. So when we speak of nihilism in this sense, uh, we are talking of something that can be defined as hermeneutic nihilism. I mean, uh, nihilism in, in the Nietzsche's sense, uh, if we want to use this bad word for uh, 
the philosopher, um, well, it's, uh, it's the understanding uh, that the interpretation is based on nothing. There is not a reason for interpretation. Interpretation is free. So, in this sense, uh, the hermeneutic nihilism that Nietzsche is talking about, in a sense, without using the word, uh, the hermeneutic nihilism is the condition of human freedom. But there is another kind of nihilism. Financial capitalism. Financial capitalism is, uh, is uh, I would call it, uh, active nihilism, in the sense that it's the production of nihil. It is not the um, um, creation of something on the ground of the non-existence uh, of uh, a natural law. It's the destruction of something existing. It's the active produc production of nihil. So I'm trying, uh, I frankly, I don't know where I'm going. Um, I am trying to, to find um, some strength, some possibility, some future, yes, from, uh, uh, from poetry. I'm trying to find the possibility of rebuilding a process uh, of, um, of autonomy of autonomy, of social life, of autonomy, of, uh, of, um, mm, of friendship, uh, starting from the ability of poetry to create something from nothing. So in a sense, poetry is the reversal of this uh, magic ability of language uh, of producing nothing. It's the ability of building something where nothing has been produced. You remember the last uh, um, lines uh, of the fifth elegy of uh, Rilke. I, 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 I I have the, the German version of it, uh, but uh, I, I will not read it. Uh, you remember it, Engel. Es wäre ein Platz, der wir nicht wissen und dorten, and so on. You remember. Please, don't ask me <laughs> to read in German. <laughs> and um, you remember that uh, Rike is speaking uh, of a place that we don't know. We don't know that place uh, where lovers uh, do something uh, that uh, is impossible for everybody. They are uh, really doing something in their uh, towers of happiness uh, and they are launching their last uh, uh, coins. Uh, there is a part of the of uh, of the poem where he speaks of having uh, gültigen Münzen des Glücks uh, and so on, um, money, dissipation of money. This is happiness. What is he talking about? Uh, who knows? Reading Rilke is always uh, an, an act of invention, but in my opinion, he is speaking uh, about the creation of the place, the creation of a place that is a non existing place, the creation of a place uh, that is exactly the reversal of the destruction that the, the the, the economy is producing nowadays. In a sense, this is my way to deal with the, the failure, if you want, the dissolution, 
the end of uh, the last movement that we have been knowing worldwide, Occupy. Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Tahrir Square, Occupy 60 cities in Spain for one month. Historians um, will probably speak of the year 2011 as, uh, as a year of decision. In a sense, in my, in my personal uh, uh, history, I see the year 2011 as uh, the final point of a process that started in I could not understand what was happening. I see. Yeah, call them here. What, what can I do? What are you doing? What are you doing? I, I don't understand what's happening. It's not part of the show. <laughs> uh, and uh, no, it's a little bit embarrassing to and uh, bad. Uh, what should I do? <laughs> well, I, I was saying that. Uh, I see 2011 as the final point of the process. Because you know a uh, process that starts in 68, or probably starts in 64. In December 264, Mario Savio, an Italo-American student who in, in the square of Berkeley, California, speaks, uh, spoke with spoke to a crowd of 5,000 students saying uh, very, very impressive words about uh, the relation between uh, uh, knowledge and war. 64, the war in Vietnam was just uh, beginning. And uh, he says, when we discover that our knowledge is taken and used by the machine of war, we feel so sick in the heart uh, that we want to take our bodies and put our bodies in, inside the machine, against the machine, to stop the machine. It's the beginning. It's the beginning of a process. The process uh, that was essentially the attempt to, to, to free to emancipate knowledge, uh, to emancipate uh, uh, the general intellect uh, um, from the domination of the war machine. This, this attempt has lasted until 2011. In 2011, I have the impression that this attempt uh, comes to an end. 
after 2011 in Cairo, in Damas, in London, in Madrid, in Wall Street, now you know the Cotti Park uh, is closed, the, you cannot meet more than two persons in the Cotti Park. It's forbidden. Well, after 2011, the attempt to emancipate uh, knowledge from war is over. The production of nothing, the acti active nihilism of financial capitalism has, uh, has, uh, has won, has closed the door to any possibility of, uh, of, of life, of friendship. Um, well, by the political point of view, I do not see any way out. By the point of view of uh, the, the social ability to build solidarity, I do not see any way out for many reasons that I don't want to enlist. Just I say something uh, easy to understand. Precariousness uh, has destroyed the very the very condition of solidarity, of friendship, uh, of communality. So this is my, my present point. The understanding that the process uh, that we have called Occupy is over. But then I, I, I start uh, thinking about the meaning of that word, occupy. Occupy what? Occupy a place, occupy a square, occupy a, a, a physical space, like a street, right? But the problem is, is not there. When people started occupying, uh, think to the Spanish Acampada, one month, uh, May, June 2011, six million people in the streets every day, every night. But why are you doing that? Do you think that this is the political way to stop the distraction? The distraction is not physical. The distraction is not happening in the streets. The distraction is not happening in the square. The distraction is happening nowhere. Is, is happening in the cyberspace, is, up, is happening in the re relation between mathematical functions. So, in a sense, uh, the process of Occupy has been the last attempt uh, to recompose a social body. By this point of view, it was the only way to start a process, but then, then you see what has happened of the, of the collective body in Cairo or uh, in London uh, to different kinds of uh, despair, of depression. Well, I think that the next step uh, will be, I don't know when, uh, a step uh, in, uh, in, in a dimension that has nothing to do with uh, the, the physical space. In a sense, the body needs to recompose itself, but at the same time, the body needs to walk in a space that is not a physical space, which is not a bodily space. This is why I, I am asking some help to poetry. This is why I think that uh, art, poetry are, uh, mm, are, uh, uh, are becoming the only possibility of reactivation of, uh, of an energy that has to be a bodily energy, but has, it has uh, simultaneously to be able to walk in 
in the space of nothingness, in a space uh, where uh, existence is nothing. Well, I beg your pardon for the confusion, uh, and well, I stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs>